the Lord Jesus has played an important role in my life. Before I get started, I want to I pray. And you see the title of our message, I want to pray, and then we'll get right into it. Father, we thank you that we're here at your feet, Lord. I want to know more about you. I want to feel your presence once again, Lord. Lord, I pray that the blood of Jesus cover, wash, take away all the sin, the shame. Lord, I bind even the stubborn spirit that be hindering people from learning of you and worshiping you. Lord, I ask you to take the scales off our eyes that we may see you as you really are and See, into the spirit realm, where we need to go harder towards you, Lord. That every stumbling block will be revealed, that we may maneuver around it and make haste to do the work of the Lord. And Lord, we thank you for what you're about to do. Lord, I ask you as I, I share what you placed on my heart. Lord, I ask you to give me new revelation. Let the word of God move through me, Lord, and go out and accomplish his purpose. Someone came in here needing to hear a word from you, Lord. Lord, I ask you to do just that. Answer their prayer. Let them leave you renewed or with an answer from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen, I what are we talking about tonight? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Four months ago, today, I think it was June the 14th, on a Sunday, I preached a message, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. The reason I preach that message that I could see off in the spiritual realm that a powerful attack was coming toward this body of believers. That the enemy was going to try to slow us down. We was building momentum to make an impact in this community and the enemy saw it as a threat and he he was sending an attack and what I saw in the spirit that he was forming weapons specially for us that would discourage us that will attack our not only our finances our family our church body and I needed to warn the people and I needed to warn the people that that tack was, it was actually strategically toward a lot of the leadership and the key families in the church. And as I, as I shared that, I remember sharing that we would have to stand together. We would have to stand together and say no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And uh, and as I, that was in June, right about the beginning of August, I could see things happen in the spirit. I can see how the enemy was coming in and attacking different leaders and different homes. And when I, I saw this going on, I... I say, surely they see what's going on. Surely they can see this is an attack that I forewarned the people about. And that we're going to stand together. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. But it broke my heart as the enemy started attacking the body of believers. People started pointing fingers at the different ones. It's their fault, their fault, that fault. But we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. And a lot of times the enemy try to get us to focus on other people that he can continue to operate unnoticed. He can continue to do damage in the congregation. Instead of focusing on the real enemy, we're focusing on flesh and blood. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In that scripture, it says at least four times in that one verse that it's, it's something against us. There's we're gonna, it's something going to be against us and we're going to be fighting something and that something is not flesh and blood. You know, I, I, I talk about fighting and warring in the spirit a lot. And a lot of people think I talk about that because I was in the uh, military. Just finished 26 years in the military. But I'm the least confrontational guy you ever want to meet. I don't talk about warring in the spirit because of my military experience. I talk about war in the spirit because of my personal experience. I was raised with my grandparents way out in the country. And uh, I actually lived probably from here to the road from the church I attended. My, my grandparents was a, my grandmother was a disciplinary. She, we didn't, we didn't play marbles because it was of the devil. We don't, you don't go fishing on Sunday. You don't iron your clothes on Sunday. You just had to wrink, go wrinkle if you didn't iron them on Saturday. And she didn't believe in sparing the rod. She believed in giving a whooping. Actually, that church had a, a bush right outside the church where you can grab a switch on the way in. <laughs> And I see a lot of men would have their coat jackets and they have a switch slid up in the sleeve. They could <laughs> put it back real quick. Amen. Well, but my, my grandmother believed in a whooping or a switch could cure everything. I used to, I, sometimes I used to do something, get on her nerves. She would say, boy, don't let me come over there. And knock the devil out of you. And I, after I got older, I began to think about that. I said, well, I guess she thought if I had a demonic spirit within me, she would hit me so hard that the demon would jump out and say, I don't want to be a part of that. And what I learned is, it's just the opposite. A demonic spirit could have a, attached to a child and the child show out. And as a parents and as adults, we can take it out on the flesh and blood instead of the spirit. We could beat that child and try to beat that spirit out of them. And all we are doing is putting a wedge between you and that child. It's, and the enemy is in there just laughing. He loved you to do that. And, you know, after I got older, most of the time, the discipline. The discipline you learn from your parents or grandparents, you kind of, that's what you use in the home. So early on with my children, everybody know I have seven daughters. Early on, uh, when I was raising my daughters, I was a strict disciplinarian. But I had one of my kids, one of my children, when I would spank them. Most of the time I used a switch. I never used an extension cord. I used a switch or a belt. Because I heard the hand could be heavy. So I used a switch or a belt. And I would discipline one of my daughters. And she would hold her breath. And her eyes would roll back in her head. And she would pass out. And I would have to get up and revive her. And this happened 
all the time. Every time I discipline her, she would. And I would, it, it, sometimes it took uh, two or three minutes for her to come back to. And one night, I was a young Christian. One night I took that daughter. She was only five or six years old. I took her into the downstairs bathroom. I sat on my knee. And I, when I sat on my knee, I started praying for her. I start praying and I start pleading the blood over her. And as I start pleading the blood over her and binding things and calling things out, that child that was five or six sat up on my knee. Her uh, back got very straight and she got this close to my face. And her face distorted and she stared at me. For about five minutes, this close, stared at me. That night I realized I wasn't dealing with flesh and blood. I, deal, I realized what I was dealing with, a belt or a switch, wouldn't help. Only thing would help is the word of God and prayer and the blood of Jesus. And I can tell you, after that night, she never, ever did that again. That spirit was gone. We don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That night, I got mad at the devil. I got mad at the enemy. And that's why I talk about warring in the spirit all the time. No Spirit, evil spirit would come in my house unchallenged. If I have to push the plate down, if I have to fast for a week, two weeks, he would not come in my house unchallenged. And that's why I talk about warring in the spirit all the time because of that experience. And I know it worked. In Mark 9, chapter 17 and 28 verse, I don't, tonight, I don't know, I got a couple scriptures, I don't know where I'm going with this, I'm just getting out here by faith, hoping that what I say will touch somebody, someone, eyes will be open to what's going on. But Mark 9, chapter 17 to 18 verse, it was a man that had a son that was possessed with a demonic spirit. He didn't know what to do. And he brought the, the child to Jesus. He said, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who was possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and become rigid. And I asked my, your disciples to drive him out, of, drive the spirit out, but they could not. This man had realized he had a, a child that had an issue. And it wasn't an issue with his flesh and blood. He, he knew it was a spiritual issue. Nowadays, if Children have issues like that usually. They are a subject of abuse. Sometimes they're put in a home, and most of the time now, they're medicated. A lot of people are medicating children when all it takes for you is to push back the plate, believe God's word, and plead the blood and pray for your child. But you go through great lengths getting them to some type of medical facility and get them medicated. And at the end of this scripture, it says, it says your, your disciples couldn't cast him out. And Jesus cast the devil out of this man, this young, this boy. And at the end, the disciple says, Lord, why can we cast him out? And Jesus' response is, this kind 
will come only by fasting and prayer. And a lot of times we're in our homes and different places we're dealing with this kind. When have the last time you fast? The Bible tells us to fast and pray. And a lot of times God will open our understanding or move on our behalf if we're fasting and praying. It's, and Jesus didn't blame the boy. After he cast the demon out, he picked up the boy by the hand. And he said he, he had been dealing with this since he was a child. But uh, it's getting close to Halloween. And I was looking on the internet, I think, Monday night. And now they have a, a Ouija board app for your phones. I don't know if you're aware of that. You can go get a free Ouija board app. Your children can go get a free Ouija board app for the iPhone or whatever phone they have. And on Monday, it was a, 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 a few teenagers had got this Ouija board app and they was playing with it. And a demonic spirit entered, uh, I know one of the girls, and she was violently screaming and hollering and growling. And they took her, as a Peruvian girl, they took her to the priest. And the priest said, I don't want nothing to do with it. Take her somewhere else. And they took the, the lady to the hospital. It was a young girl. I think she's probably in her uh, upper teens. They took her to the hospital and she was tied to this gurney, strapped, growling and screaming. And the medical workers didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do with her. But I need you to be aware of things like that, Ouija board applications. It actually gives a door for the enemy to come in. And those children and those young adults, they think it's fun and game. They think it's something scary they could do on Halloween with the group of kids. And they are allowed something to enter in. And those same teenagers and young adults will come here on Sunday and sit in the pews and the chairs. And a lot of time they're, most of the time they're distracted because they don't let something enter in. And I just wanted to be aware of that and you can, I want you to look at that video. My heart go out for just playing around. The enemy is real. And you can't, flesh and blood can't, you can't do anything that flesh and blood unless you put her to sleep. How many know the, the devil? Our next slide. I, talks about, I talked about people coming in the church that allow things to come in. How many know that the devil goes to church? Anybody know that? Know that the devil goes to church. Amen. And uh, this right here. This scripture is from Luke, the fourth chapter. Uh, 31st to the 33rd verse. And this is when Jesus was uh, in Capernaum. It says, then Jesus went down into Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath, he taught the people. And they were amazed at this teaching because his words had authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon and in unpure spirit. And he cried out at the top of his voice. And what he, I didn't put the verse on that, but he cried out, Jesus of Nazareth, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now how this scripture is written, that man had been in that, synagogue for a while and only when Jesus came with that authority and that Holy Spirit that's when the demonic spirit spoke out he said I know who you are you're the holy man of God and uh, in, in that scripture he cast the demon out of that man but the man stayed in the church now, if things like that happen in the church, we throw the, the person out, thinking it's the flesh and blood and it's a spirit. About before I got down here in, in uh, Pensacola, 
I was stationed in Washington State near Seattle. Um, I was on a ship there. And the ship that I was on came down to San Diego. And so it transited down to San Diego. And the church I attended, I got saved, I got ordained a deacon, was in San Diego. And when I, the ship came down, I wanted to attend my old church. I just wanted to let them know that I'm still living a saved life. I'm still fighting for the Lord. And I remember coming into the church. It's a very large church, probably six, about 400 people. I came in, and I had to stand at the door, wait on a seat. And I was, and after uh, the usher signaled me to have a seat, I, I had a seat on the end of a row next to a young lady. And I remember sitting down in a chair. And when I got there, I'm, most of the time when I get to the house of God, I thank God for letting me make it there, thank, uh, make it there safe, and I pray that God has a word for me. And so as I sat down, I started, I just started praying to myself. Uh, Lord, I thank you for letting me make it transit down to Washington. Lord, I, uh, uh, Lord, I ask you to have a word for me today. And, and I was just praying to myself, and I don't know if it was in my spirit or audibly, I heard a growl. And I looked over at the young lady that was sitting next to me. And she looked at me and smiled. And after she looked at me and smiled, she screamed at the top of her lungs, he is bothering me. Get him away from me. Get him away from me. It was 450 people in this church. And I left there as a, a deacon. She totally embarrassed me in the church like I was touching her or something. And interrupted the whole service. And the ushers came over and grabbed me and took me all the way to the back door. And when I sat down at the back door, the young lady I was sitting beside, she looked back and she smiled. And I was hot. I was hot. I hadn't did anything to her. I hadn't even said anything out loud. But she sensed the spirit that was in me when I sat down. And she didn't want to be nowhere near me. And I remember going to the back pew right beside the door. And I was, I wanted to leave. I was so mad. I was so angry and so embarrassed. I wanted to leave. But the Lord told me, don't leave. Just stay there and hear the message. And the message that day was about, uh, about I think it was Peter on the island, shipwrecked on the island. And he had gathered some sticks to get ready to throw them in the fire. And when he got ready to throw the sticks in the fire, it was a serpent in, that, in those sticks. And when the serpent felt the heat of the flame, that serpent came out and bit him on the hand. And he shook him off. And the message that day was the enemy could have hide in the house of God long as things are dry. Long as people around are not filled with the Holy Spirit, they don't feel that fire. If they feel that fire, you lash out and attack. And it spoke straight to my situation, my circumstances. And I sat there and I watched. I sat there and watched another person be able to sit there, and she didn't have any problem with it. I was watching the other day. It was this, this man over in Africa that had, had been possessed, possessed by this demonic spirit. And, he, and after he was delivered, what, what he said happened. He says his mothers couldn't, couldn't have a child. And his mother's brother took his sister to a witch doctor. And they did some voodoo on her and gave her a, a, a potion. And when she gave a potion, she, she, uh, she was able to have a child. And he was born from that voodoo spell and that potion. And he said that ever since he was young, he came inside the, the churches. And his job was to disrupt the service. His job was to look good, smell good, distract people. And he said if he would come into service and he... He said he could tell when the people had the Holy Spirit, he could see a flame of fire on them. He said if he would go to a church and if he didn't see anybody with a flame of fire, he would leave. 
It was no reason to be there because those people would never affect anybody. He says his assignment was to go to a church and he could see the flame of fire to discourage people, cause so much confusion that the, the pastor and the leaders will finally give up. He said everywhere he went, he was one of the, the largest tithers. He was the largest giver. And a lot of times they knew he was stirring up pro problems, but they wouldn't get rid of him because he was the largest giver. And that it just kind of interests me to how the enemy works inside the church. First Peter 5 and 8 say, be on your guard and stay awake. For the enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking around to find who he may attack. And he don't just attack with those type of demonic spirit. He, he has a called a whispering spirit. Jesus was telling the disciples about how he was going to one day die. He was going to suffer things by the elders and the priests. And he was going to die by the hand of the elders and the priests. He said, in the third day, I was gonna, he, he's going to rise again. And Peter heard that, and Peter grabbed Jesus and rebuked him. He said, not so, Lord. You will never die. You will never do this. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. He looked at Peter, but he was speaking to that whispering spirit that was whispering in in, in, um, in Peter's ear. And a lot of times, Peter said that out of love. What Peter said was out of love. And a lot of times, in the church, since we're dealing with spiritual wickedness in high places, a lot of times we can say stuff out of love. And a lot of times when it gets in the air, he's the God of the air, he can twist it. And when it goes in someone's ear, that person could take offense to it. And that's why it's so important for us to be forgiving one toward another because you don't know after that thing leave your lips or been passed between two or three people what got to their ears or what they heard or what the enemy whispered in their ear what they meant about it. And a lot of times that person could be offended. And this is how the enemy works in the church to cause division, to keep us from moving forward. And he only attacks when you're moving forward. Those churches not, not doing anything, he don't cause any confusion. He don't attack them because they're not doing anything. This is the last thing I, I want to talk about is one of the major things he used is discouragement discouragement. Hebrews 10 and 25 says, let us not give up meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more until you, uh, as you see the day approaching. The scripture says we are continue to meet together but our meeting together is to encourage one another that we won't be discouraged. Many faithful preachers that have battled all type of temptations and faithful in all type of things, sometimes they succumb to discouragement. Sometimes pastors are doing their level, their very best, preaching the word and praying for the people. And they hear complaints that would discourage them. They might have a program that something don't go right. The sound system goes down or something don't go right. And they get discouraged and Satan put a, put a seed of discouragement in them. That's why we should pray for our leaders, pray for our pastors. And our, and our purpose of meeting together is to keep encouraging one another. Most of the time, the, the man that is standing up here, he's doing his very best. And a lot of times, just... Some crit 
critical words or hearing criticism, it calls an impact on him. A lot of times you can look out in the congregation and you don't see as many people in the chairs and sometimes you can get discouraged and the enemy will put that seed of a discouragement in your mind. There's a story about a the devil was getting ready to get rid of all his tools. And he, he was going to sell his tools and he he had all his tools laid out on his table. And he had a price by each one of his tools. I see people yawning. I'm getting ready to close here in a minute. And he had all these tools laid out on the table. And he had all the prices near us. Some of the tools look harmless. Well, a lot of the tools look treacherous. Some of the tools that, that look treacherous was a tool of envy, jealousy, deceit, pride. And it was laid out on the table, and one was laid on the end of the table by itself. It looked it harmless. Looked like it wouldn't hurt a fly, but it was very worn out, and it was priced very, very high. It was five times more than the rest of the tools. And the person that was shopping asked, what, what's going on with that tool there? What's the name of that tool? And the devil said, that's discouragement. He said, why is it priced so high? He said, because the stir discouragement has been more useful to me than any other uh, tool I've had. He said, he can pry open the heart and get inside a man's heart. And I can get closer to him than any other tool I have, discouragement. It's badly worn because I can use it on anyone. Only a few, pe few people know that is one of my tools. And that's how I can use it on so many people. And a lot of times the enemy tactic is bombard you with so many problems so many issues, you get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. That is the number one tool of the enemy, to get discouraged and want to make you give up. Throw your hands in the air. I remember the very first time I got discouraged serving God. I was a very young deacon. I was probably 28, and they put me on a a planning board. We was having a youth revival for the whole city of San Diego. And they put me on the planning committee. And my job was to introduce the speaker each night. And they asked me, I was a very young deacon. They asked me for my input. And I honestly gave them my input. And I remember it was two young ladies to my right. When I gave my input, they started laughing. And when they started laughing, I got discouraged. Not only I didn't introduce the speakers, I didn't even show up for the whole revival. That almost made me backslide. I got so discouraged in my spirit. The enemy was speaking. You don't even have to go back. Because if you go back, they're going to ask you where you've been. And you don't want to lie to them, so you don't even have to deal with that. And I remember going and not been a deacon at the church and not showing up for a month until I could get that thing off me. Discouragement. That was the number one tool of the enemy. And I'm getting ready to close here. Finally, it says, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full arm of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. This is going to include my study for the night. Next Wednesday, I want to talk about the, the weapons of our warfare, the spiritual weapons and the armor of God that will help you in this end time to get you where God wants you to be. At this time, is Beth out. At this time, I want to close with prayer. And if you, if you would, uh, we want to have congregation of prayer. If you would, you could come up and we can pray up front. But I want to 
I'm going to be out of here before 8 o'clock. And I don't have anyone praying, praying for me, so you can pray where you're at, and you can come to the altar and pray. But I want to I pray for us, this congregation, where we're going, and those that are dealing with problems and health issues. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, that you are one and true God. Victory is on our side. That no weapon formed against us shall prosper. That we're more than a conqueror in you. Lord, you gave us the word of God. The word of our testimony. The blood of Jesus. Lord, we ask you right now to renew our strength. Those that's been discouraged, Lord, we ask you to encourage their heart. Lord, that we may serve notice to the enemy that victory is ours, that no weapons formed against us shall prosper. Even though we sustain attack, we're still going forward in the power and the strength of this Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you those that are here that, that have sickness and illnesses. Lord, we plead your blood against it right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to stir up your spirit in this place. Those that are having problem in their marriages and the problem with their children, I speak the word to enemy. Cease and assist. The blood of Jesus is against you. Lord, we ask you to send strong angels home with every, every person that is present today, Lord. Lord, that we may take the scales off our eyes, that we may see even into the supernatural, see the, the enemy's schemes, that he's laid, laid wait to destroy our marriage, destroy our homes, cause division. Lord, we know we don't deal with flesh and blood. Lord, empower us with the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus to defeat every weapon of the enemy. Lord, that child that's been fighting by themselves, Yiddy, that child that's been on their own fighting this battle I speak to that parent right now that they may speak over that child that where they will fast and pray repeat the words of Jesus that that spirit may leave and be replaced with love and peace Lord, I ask you to put a warrior spirit over the people in this house. Yeah. Oh God, it is more important for us to, to get out on our knees and pray. Seek your face. Pray for the people of God. Forgive those that have offended us that we may see the salvation of the Lord right here in this house. That miracles will be an everyday occurrence right here in this house. Oh God, I pray for every man, every husband, that you would raise him up to be the priest of that household that will span in the gap that will challenge the enemy on every hand. Lord, for those that don't have a man in the home, I ask you to put that same anointing on the mother, the woman there. 
that they may stand in the gap with all your power and authority and Lord as the word is spoken as the blood is pleaded Lord we ask you to wash them from every sickness every ailment every disease every attack of the enemy in the name of Jesus yes Lord Lord, right now, I ask you to lift the heaviness that is in the room. Lord, I pray for Anna Oglesby right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I pray that what has bound up, that by the power of the living God, by the name of Jesus, she's made free and loose right now in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood against. Lord, we ask you to wash her mind and wash her heart. Lord, I pray for those that are going into surgery on tomorrow. Charles and Vera. Lord, we ask you to assign the angel beside her beds them to their bedside to protect them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to bless businesses. Give jobs to those that need jobs. Bless families. Those where the enemy had came in and caused confusion. Lord, we ask you to give peace. Restore the joy. Lord, we ask you right now, those that are where it's been put in a families. That you place those families back together, mended by your love and your forgiveness, right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and what you will do. Lord, let your peace overshadow us. Send your peace to our homes. Send your peace in our relationships. Send your peace with our relationships with our children, our grandchildren, in our marriages. Send your peace here in this congregation. Lord, I thank you right now what you're doing. I thank you for what you do. do. I thank you for the service. I thank you for the word that went forth. Lord, I pray that the word will cause a change in their life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen. I do thank you all for coming out tonight. And we'll be studying spiritual weapons next Wednesday. And we're going to continue on this warrior spirit going to take us a warrior spirit to get where God wants us to go. As we do all the stand, we're going to continue to stand. We're going to continue to stand. We're going to continue to move forward. And we're going to recognize it's the enemy that's causing this confusion. It's not your sister and your brother. We're going to call it as it is. And we're going to move forward and keep praying and keep praying in the spirit and keep loving each other and keep moving forward. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>